Okay, maybe we'll get going. Um, hello, everyone, uh, and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Shir Ganor. I'm an assistant professor of history at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. And uh, on behalf of uh, the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies at the University, I'd like to welcome everyone who is joining us today. This presentation today is uh, organized as uh, a part of a series of events marking Indigenous Peoples Week. Uh, as part of the campus community, the center recognizes that our university is located on ancestral and contemporary Indigenous lands that were seized from the Dakota people. And we are committed to educating ourselves, our colleagues, and the student population about local and global histories of Indigenous people, as well as to honoring Indigenous communities in the present. And today it is my honor to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Haider Tung Tun whose name uh, translates uh, to firm rock in the Maya Yucatec language. Dr. Tuntun is uh, an ACLS Emerging Voices postdoctoral fellow at the University of California, Irvine, uh, where he focuses on the study of the Mayan human rights movement, a movement uh, that promotes the recognition of colonial relations, the value of women as knowledge keepers and leaders, and respect for the environment. He is currently working on a book project which is titled The Emergence of Human Rights in the Mayan World, Rural Church and Indigenous Activism in Guatemala from 1943 till 1983. In this interdisciplinary project, he works to advance our understanding of human rights in the Mayan world and provide decolonizing methodologies for the study of indigenous communities in Latin America. Thank you so much, Hader, for joining us today, and we look forward to your presentation and to the discussion afterwards. Um, thank you so much, Shir, for, for the introduction. And, and before to, to start, um, I just want to thank the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies, Dr. Shir Ganor, uh, Dr. Alejandro Baer, and Joe Egger for preparing this, this, um, uh, this platform uh, for the invitation. And I have to I have to say that I graduated from the University of Minnesota a couple of months ago, and I I was part of the of the human rights graduate minor, and I received a lot of support from the uh, ICGC at the university. So I think um, I I I cannot I cannot start naming people, but I think uh, the University of Minnesota I, I, I'm very thankful for being there and, and having the support of the the community there. Um, so um, I'm going to start sharing my my screen. Uh, okay, so let me start. <clears throat> so the the title of my 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 presentation is 500 Years Indigenous Responses to History and Human Rights in Guatemala Within the 1980s." My scholarship focuses on understanding the ways in which indigenous communities and women's organizations have influenced human rights in Guatemala and in El Salvador. Today, I will, like, uh, I will talk about my project in the Mayan world, which focuses on the activism of local communities in rural areas of Guatemala. I argue that the historical perspective of human rights uh, I argue that the historical perspective of human rights movement in Guatemala that led to the recognition of the genocide against Maya people was largely influenced by historical view of, of the situation of marginalized communities prompted by the local organizations such as the Committee of Peasant Unity or Cook. In this case, the movement known as 500 Years of Indigenous Black and Popular Resistance compiled several efforts of marginal, marginalized communities that were facing similar challenges, such as the Cook. The Committee of Peasant Unity was one of the main organizations that supported the 500 years movement in the 1980s. So Guatemala is located in Central America and shared its border with Mexico, Salvador, Belize, and Honduras. My work is contextualized in the armed conflict that started in 1960 and finished in 1996 with the signing of the peace accords. <clears throat> 
During these 36 years of confrontation between 1980 and 1982, the Guatemalan government adopted a scorched earth campaign against indigenous communities. During these years, the government sponsored several massacres that today are recognized as genocide. The scholars have worked to document the levels of violence and its consequences in society. Cultural anthropologists in particular have called up the levels of repression that existed in the departments of El Quiche and Huehuetenango and the polarization that, that this conflict create among local communities. Many interdisciplinary efforts are focused on indigenous communities experience violence and managed to survive in the, during the 1980s. One significant outcome of, this, of the responses made by uh, indigenous communities was the creation of the Panmaya movement that sought to unify indigenous groups of Guatemala under one Mayan identity. So one thing that is important to keep in mind is that in the Maya, in the 1980s, this idea of the Maya as such didn't exist. And it was very complicated about one uh, monolithic or one idea of one unification among indigenous groups. On the maps, I think, uh, I think it's something that I, I, I like to encourage people to think and connect the Guatemalan landscape with the political division that exists in the country and how violence was performed, but also how activism is performed. In this case, my, 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 focus, uh, my focus is not on Guatemala City, not in the capital city, but rather in the, in the indigenous communities and the rural communities that exist. On the map that these are the, uh, at the right, we can see the landscape in which it's clear that the departments of Huehuetenango and Iquiche are located in the highlands of the country. Those places are very difficult to, to get access just because the landscape is, is very difficult. In the landscape, um, most of the, in the, in the highlands of this country, most of the population are indigenous. So when we think about the departments of Huehuetenango and Iquiche, we, it, it is right to think that we are thinking about the highlands of the country and also the places in which most of the indigenous uh, people live. New trends of scholarship have paid attention to the networks of local activism that existed in rural communities in the highlands of Guatemala during the 1970s, and how these efforts supported the human rights movement. In this case, my work focuses on reconstructing the alliances and local intellectual efforts of peasants and indigenous communities to push for social justice during the 1970s and the 1980s and call attention to the need to contextualize violence and social injustice with a long-term and historical relations. The Guatemalan case is important not only because of the levels of violence reached during the 1980s, but also because of the ways in which human rights movement adopt an historical approach of these events. Greg Randin, for example, had identified that the Guatemalan Commission for Historical Clarification or the Guatemalan Truth Commission was innovative given the historical analysis it used to explain violence. In contrast to previous truth commissions like the Chilean and the Argentinian, the Guatemalan Truth Commission did not assume that the violence in the 1980s were just an interruption in history, but was in fact connected to a long history of social relations in which indigenous groups were marginalized and exploited. Grandin said, open quote, in most food commissions, history was not presented as a network of causal and social and cultural relations, but rather as a dark backdrop in which to contrast the light of tolerance and self-restraint, end of quotation. Grandin analysis refers to the conclusions of the Guatemalan Truth Commission that connect the levels of violence of the 1980s to the larger history of relations of repression against marginalized communities. The Truth Commission recognized the existence of racism and exclusion since the creation of the Guatemalan state in 1821. Also contextualized how the events of the 1980s and to the 1982 were an example of the colonial history, histories that continue in the country. So in this case, my, 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 my perspective as a as historian, working on human rights is like this historical perspective had to have a, a, a context, a social historical context. In my mind, it was not just like the Truth Commission was just willing to accept this historical perspective. But in fact, there was a larger discussion. There was like almost 15 years of activism and intellectual discussions about how to talk about violence. And these discussions were uh, pushed by local organizations like the Cook and not just in Guatemala, but in the Americas as a, as, as a, as a support. 
The perspective of 500 years movement helps to explain the social historical conditions in which the uh, Guatemalan Truth Commission adopt an historical perspective. During the, uh, during the end of the 1980s throughout the 1992, many individuals and groups in Latin America expressed concerns about the patterns of colonization, new colonization and colonial relations that plug their communities. As part of the 500 years movement, in relation to the commemoration of the 500 years of contact between the Americas and Europe, indigenous group questioned the relegated position in society and cyclical instance of violence throughout this history, long history of contact. And again, we are talking about these 500 years in relation to 1992, because it was like a, a huge, a huge um, a moment in which indigenous groups have to think about what was the situation after 500 years of contact. An initial effort of this movement was the creation of the Encuentros de Organizaciones Campesino e Indígenas, meetings of peasant and indigenous organizations whose principal objective was to discuss common challenges facing marginalized groups in the Americas. This group had far larger meetings, and the first one was in Sao Paulo, Brazil in 1990, in, the, in, 1990, in May, in Quito, Ecuador in July 1990, in Bogota, Colombia in 1991, January, in Chocotla, Morelos, in Mexico in 1991, and, the, and notably, the last of these encounters took place in the indigenous capital of Guatemala, Xelacu or Quetzaltenango, by the end of 1991, where participants discussed topics connected to the Guatemala armed conflict and integral to the situation of indigenous groups, such as democracy, human rights, tierra y vida, land and life, colonialism, neocolonialism, autodetermination, women's rights, and youth. And again, the 500 years movement, even though we are talking uh, uh, about Guatemala, it was a larger movement in the Americas in which the Guatemalan case, um, given the activism and the situation that was happening, and uh, it was kind of the center of this discussion. The outcome of this meeting was the presentation of the Campaña 500, 500 Años de Resistencia Indígena Negra y Popular. The outcome of this meeting was the presentation of the campaign, 500 years campaign of indigenous black and popular resistance in Quetzaltenango in 1991. And the nomination of Rigoberto Menchu for the Nobel Peace Prize. Menchu's nomination acknowledged the participation of leadership of women who had survived genocidal attempts dating back to colonial times and highlighted the existence of indigenous women leaders that had gone unnoticed with the patriarchal hierarchies of colonial structures. The final report of this meeting declared the importance of recognizing women's leadership, given, uh, open quote, given the role as generadoras de la vida y buscadoras incansables de la libertad. Recognizing women's leadership, given the, the role, open quote, as generators of life and letterness seekers of liberty, end of quote. In addition to the 500 years campaign promoted the ideas respect to the environment, unity among Afro-Latino, indigenous, and marginalized groups, and the need to understand history with the debut of marginalized groups. The campaign document stated, open quote, that is also um, in, the, in the screen. The official history of the conquest has been presented from the point of view of the colonizer, which seeks to convert the conquerors into heroes. It has a history that brings us to see us throughout the eyes of the owner masters, and because of that, ignore us and make us our own communities ignore one another." End of quote. And again, this seems to be very familiar to current activism, and particularly with this tension and discussions about monuments, but it's something that was being largely discussed in the 1990s. So it's, it, in this case, something I, I like to tell my students is like, we have to think to, as historians to contextualize these, these movements that are happening today. This call to refine history in the Americas was made with the intention of creating common ground for indigenous communities in the Americas and encouraging them to share challenges that they face over time. At the same time, the document also made a call for the recognition of ethnic and racial diversity. Open quote, that is the, the one below this one. Open quote, identity supposes a constructive process within cultural diversity. This means that identity does not negate cultural diversity, but rather the contrary. It recognizes and reaffirms it. We say then that identity is the consciousness that we have as a social groups 
of possessive elements and characteristics that make us feel and perceive ourselves as this, this, this distinct from other groups, end of quote. The historical perspective of the Guatemalan Truth Commission and the recognition of the Maya people as a community affected by armed conflict resonates a lot with the 500 years campaign. In addition to, in addition, other sections of the, uh, in addition to the conclusion to the Guatemala Truth Commission report, there are the peace agreements that also resonate with this 500 years movement. For example, in 1995, one year before the signing of the peace accords, the representatives that were negotiating the accords declared and presented to the public the accords about the identity and rights of indigenous community. Before the peace accords, there were this series of conversation in which they were discussing how it's going to be after the armed conflict. And these discussions were important because they kind of established not just the legal framework, but also like the, the way in which they're going to be thinking about the violence in Guatemala. So this document, the accords about identity and rights of indigenous community, recognized and declared, open quote, based on its history, conquest, colonization, displacements, and migration, the Guatemalan nation has a multi-ethnic, pluricultural, and multilingual character. The parts most recognize and respect the identity and political, economic, social, and cultural rights of the Maya, Garifona, and Xinca communities with the national unity and the indivisibility of the territory of the Guatemalan state as component of such unity. I mean, I would need <laughs> like one hour to kind of a, 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 a talk about the different component, components of this um, statement. But in this case, just the fact that the, 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 the peace accords are recognizing that in Guatemala, there are not only my communities that are, is this umbrella term, but also there are Xinca and Garifuna communities. They are saying that the, the Xinca is also indigenous community that are not part of the Mayan world, or they are indigenous as well. And more important, this idea of the Garifuna, the Afro-descendants even in, in, in Guatemala, is also another recognition of these, uh, these stories that were uh, being silenced over uh, do these colonial uh, histories and these colonial perspectives of how to, to write nationalistic stories. And again, these conclusions that the Truth Commission and the Peace Accords participants were having, I believe that was part of this 500 years movement that was kind of, was, was, was cooking, was, was developing in the, in the, uh, at the end of the 1980s and the beginning of the, of the 1990s. The 500 years campaign was an effort of Afro-Ladinos, indigenous groups and marginalized communities in the Americas that presented the activism and perspective of social injustice. The Committee of Peace and Unity was one of the organizations that participated in the creation of the 500 years campaign and promote its ideals. The, the history of the first years of activism of these peace and organizations in Guatemala provides information about how local organizations could influence the human rights movement in Guatemala and how history plays an important role. In this case, my reading of the recent history of the cook is throughout the lens of the Mayan cyclical view of history. This view of time refers to the ways in which Mayan communities are aware of the existence or repeated movements in history in which indigenous communities suffer attempts of eradication or are able to survive and continue. I would like to share the story of the Yahche to provide an example of how cyclical view of time works. I'm currently collecting oral stories in Yucatan from Mayan elders. The Yahche is a sacred Maya tree that means green tree in Maya Yucatec, and is also known as the Seiba tree. Growing up in Yucatan, I learned that Yache was part of the environment of my community and had an important symbolism and significance of local communities. All my relatives have stories that place this tree in the middle of the narrative. This tree is centered in many festivals, including the celebration of the local saint. After working with my, my intellectual... So in this case, um, so the picture of the, of the, of the left is a, well, it's a, it's a photo of the Yache that is next to a church. So it's from the community of Sukopo in, in Yucatan. And as you can see, the large yache can be a very large tree. Um, people in this community, they believe that this tree is like at least 200 years old. And, and again, people talk about this tree because it's in the middle. I mean, it's next to the, to the church. For those that are familiarized with, um, uh, with Latin America, 
you, you, you might know that churches are located in the center of the urban spaces, not just of the urban spaces, but also in the towns. So in this case, it's the Yache and the church that are in the, in the same space, sharing um, uh, um, the same importance in the community. Below is a photo from a community from Tacmec, Mexico. And you can see again the Yache that is in the middle of the, of the, of the festival. And there is a bullfight that is in, in a part of the celebration of the of the of the of the patron of the of the of the, of the community, and again, my family, my relatives, uh, everyone, the elders have a story. I have an explanation of why you should have a jache in the middle of these places, right? So, and the other photos are some photos that I have been collecting in my field works, talking to others in Guatemala, but also in Yucatan, Mexico, and sharing stories. Uh, throughout this method called Sigbal. I'm going to be talking in my conclusion about what is this Sigbal. But again, it's part of like this process of like engaging with the community, but also understanding or you know, trying to understand how the epistemology of the Mayan people works. After working with local Mayan intellectuals and elders, I learned that the Yache also symbolizes the survival of the Mayan people. In, Maya, in a Maya language lesson, I, uh, a local intellectual and elder shared this story with me. The Yache in, is central in our world and connect the Jokol Cup or earth, earth with heaven and the underground world. It's Utskar Yache branches and Utsmots Yache connect the Oshlokantiku Mayan gods that live in heaven with the Boronkantiku, the gods that live in the underground and the Jokol Cup. The Jokul Cup is in the middle and represents the earth and the community, the heart of the community. When the Spanish arrived, they attempted to destroy the native communities by burning houses, temples, milpas, archives, books, and even people. This attempt of genocide did not succeed because the Yaxche survived. The Spanish were able to burn the Yaxche, but they did not kill it. The Utmots Yaxche roots went deeper into the cenotes, the cenotes or underground water holes to get half or water needed for survival. While the Yahche may appear born or dead at the ground level, it is still alive, in a, alive on the ground and is waiting to return again. It's with most Yahche roots extend horizontally, symbolizing that the Seba tree is in a sitting position, waiting for the moment that, we, that it will take and stand. This history of the Yahche has been centered in my analysis for modern Guatemala history and local activism. So again, uh, on, the, on the left is a representation of the Mayan tree and on the right um, is, um, is a representation, is a photo of how the roots of like trees in the, in the Mayan world in, in Yucatan go to the, to the, to the cenotes or cenotes, these water holes that are on the ground. For those that are, have been in, in Yucatan Peninsula, you know that these holes uh, are, are, can be very, very, very deep and they are, they are dark and many people are scared of that. But Maya people have stories about that because there are secret places for touristic people. It's a place to swim and fun and stuff like that. But for Maya people, it's part of the religion and, and it's, it's something that is part of also the, the way in which people understand the environment. This same mural, uh, okay. During my archival work in Guatemala, I found, I found this picture made by the Committee of Peace and Unity, eh, or Cook. The top of the left of the mural states, they pluck of fruits, they cut of branches, they burn of trunk, but they couldn't kill of roots. This mural was painted by the Cook in 1985 and represents this organization's vision of the country, recent history, and the preservance of indigenous culture. In the illustration, communities from different Mayan groups come together to water the same tree, representing unity among Maya communities. The same mural is also featured in a series of books that the Cook published in the early 2000s after the recognition of the Mayan genocide. These didactic materials tell the local stories of the community in Santa Cruz del Quiche, Sacualpa, Costa Sur communities, and Huehuetenango from colonial times to the present and focus on the community survival. This circle in the map shows the, the communities that are represented in this book. And again, it's not about Guatemala City, but it's also about the rural communities. And in this circle, the, something that the, the, the cook is doing is trying to connect the people from the highlands, from the people to the coast. And the reason of that is because it, demos, it shows 
the process of immigration of the people. Indigenous communities have to go to the, to the southern coast to, to work with the fincas and the plantation that exists there because they don't have access to land. And, and I think it's very significant if just to know like where these efforts from the cook are, are located. In this, in, in this vision of the cook, the reconstruction of the local stories of communities is a way to respond and overturn genocide. Is throughout the writing of history from the viewpoint view, view of local people that roots of the tree have survived. The similarities, the similarities between the Cook's representation and the Yahche should, no, be, should be taken seriously because they reflect how modern Mayans understand their own history. The 1985 Cook mural is a visual representation of the Cook's own understanding of history uh, of their activism in Guatemala. The Cook has organized its history from its foundation to 1992 in three periods. Foundation or Nacimiento, 1972-1982, Survival, 1982-1985, and finally, Reorganization and Commitment to Human Rights started in 1985 until 1992. The 1985 mural represents the moment of the reorganization, survival, and reorganization of this organization. This organization was founded in 1978 under the leadership of local Catholic leaders who had previously been working with Spanish and American missionaries in El Quiche and Huehuetenango to enhance the conditions of life of poor communities. The cook emerged in the middle of several discussions about the existence of a conscience indigena campesina, an indigenous peasant consciousness that prompted the need to establish common grounds among marginalized groups that were to identify structures of oppression and inequality. As the violence increased in Guatemala, the Cook's work document and denounced the massacres that were happening. An important year of this organization was 1980. In 1980, a group of Cook leaders that included Vicente Menchú, the father of Rigoberta Menchú, traveled to Guatemala City to denounce the massacres in the countryside. On January 31st, 1980, these leaders, with the support of students from the San Carlos University and union workers, decided, decided to take over the Spanish embassy in Guatemala City. The government responded by fire bombing the building and burning 30 to 60 people alive, including Vicente Menchú. There were only two people that survived, the Spanish ambassador, Maxico, Maximo Caja Lopez, and the cook leader, Gregorio Yajá. Yaha, however, later that night was abducted from the hospital by armed men and murdered. His body left at the campus and the University of San Carlos. The massacre of the Spanish embassy in connection with the other cases reversed the willingness of the Guatemalan government to execute violence if necessary to achieve their goals. Following the events of the embassy, a few days later, the cook called a meeting to the symbolic church ruins of the ancient chair. The capital of the pre-colonial Cachical Kingdom, representatives from every important indigenous organization attended, including many who were not allied with the guerrillas or the coup. This unprecedented coalition produced the Xinche Declaration, which linked images of the mythic Panmaya Pass with the demands of the increasing umbrella, uh, increasingly umbrella present. This declaration is one of the first attempts to read the recent incidents of violence in Guatemala from the historical lens as well as proposed unification among indigenous people. This declaration denounces, open quotation, that is also in the, in the, in the slide. The indigenous communities of Guatemala declared and denounced to the world more than four centuries of discrimination, negation, repression, exploitation, and massacres by the foreign invaders and continue to this day by their most savage and criminal descendants." End of quote. The author of this declaration connects the January 31st event with the long history of colonial relations that exists in Guatemala by distinguishing between indigenous groups and foreign invaders whose descendants continue to perpetrate violence. The declaration argues that the massacre of the Spanish embassy was no isolated case, but rather the last massacre of our history massacres started in 1524 with those in the Tonala River. Tutul. In that year, Spanish commander Pedro de Alvarado ordered the burning of the Quiche and Quiche leaders and the many cities. Since this moment, survivors of future generations have to work under conditional exploitation and slavery even after the Guatemalan independence of 1821. 
This declaration establishes the connection between the 1944 Patricia massacre, the massacre of Sisi Risai in 1978, the Pansu's massacre in 1978, the massacre of Ishiles and Chakul, Kotzal, Uspatan, Punem since the 1970s, and the 1980 M Spanish embassy massacre as part of the long history of an attempt of genocide. This document also identifies how the exploitation and persecution against indigenous communities of Guatemala allowed the rich to accumulate wealth. The Institute Declaration is one of the first documents that acknowledge that the massacres of the 1980 were part of the genocide. This document is evidence of how historical understanding of colonial relations in Guatemala allow us to visualize how massacres in 1980s were part of the genocide. 1980 was the beginning of the worst years of the violence in Guatemala. In this year, the bishop uh, had to close the Kiche diocese after three attempts of murder. By this year, not only local people, but also foreigners were targets of the military repression. The period between 1980 to 1982 is the period of the genocide in which many communities were destroyed and burned. Because of this, many people became refugees and escaped to, to the Scorch Air campaign. By 1983, the leadership of the coup was affected. A had to hide or ex exile or flee in the country's jungle. Between 1983 to 1985, the leaders were not able to organize people or protest. And again, this document, I think, is very important where we take it into, into like this larger historical context in which uh, it's from 1980, you know, right? So when we think to the genocide, uh, we refer to 1980, uh, 1980, 1982, but it was even before. They were, these communities were attacking, uh, connecting these with colonial relations. And to me, something that is also fascinating is the fact that they are talking about 400 years. I mean, between 1980 to 1990, something happened in terms of the discussion in which these communities keep evolving their conversation to say that it's not about 400 years, but now it's about 500 years. So I think it's this period of the 1980s of activism, protest, surviving, in which these people were able to articulate this vision of 500 years of resistance that ultimately affected and influenced the Guatemala Truth Commission and the Peace Accords. The mural of 1985 marked a new beginning for the organization in which, uh, or the coup in which leaders were able to return to the country and make public appearances. Since this moment, the coup has adopted human rights as a part of its agenda. They continue documenting and denouncing massacres as well as requested justice for the victims. From 1985 to 1992, the coup participated in several efforts to recognize the situation of marginalized communities in Guatemala. One of the most important leaders was Rigoberta Menchu, whose roots of activism are connected to this organization. The participation of the coup in the 500 years campaign was in fact part of the effort to, of reorganization as the response to the state-sponsored violence. The history of the coup, its creation, activism, and reorganization is articulated in the secular view of history as presented by the history of the Yahche. My intention for highlighting this understanding of history is, develop, uh, is to develop a framework that serves indigenous communities to represent their own activism and advance human rights. Over the past 20 years, an interdisciplinary group of scholars have made a call for the need to develop methods in which indigeneity and indigenous education can stand on their own. James Jacob, Shane Jo Cheng, and Marcus K. Porter have argued that, open quote, indigenous education should be able to flourish, unbanish, unbrilled, and independent from other ways of knowing, end of quote. They recognize, open quote, that all too often no indigenous authors write popular stories of indigenous people that are partial in the outsider's instance of level of discernment, end of quote. To prevent this appropriation and the creation of mythical stories that serve the Western society, it is necessary to keep advancing in understanding of indigenous epistemologies and their perspective of the past. This task is no easy and requires interdisciplinary approaches that challenges the boundaries opposed by the Western society. Um, before I finish my presentation, um, I just wanna share that um, my grandfather passed away yesterday. And while working on this presentation, um, I was thinking a lot of his memories and like from yesterday to today. And one of the important words that I think I, I remember um, from my field work with the elders in the Mayan world and, and thinking about my grandfather 
is this word that is, is the Tsikbal. Tsikbal in, in, in Maya Yucatec um, has been translated into Spanish as conversational chatting, which is a very bad translation. And Tsikbal in Maya, we studied it within its own uh, epistemology, refers to, first of all, to this idea of respect, but also within a context of respect and acknowledging the presence of the other, we share ideas and we share of understanding of the world. In this case, the Tsikbal is applied in, in the forms in which our grandfathers uh, tell to their children the stories about their communities. But because of the importance of the Tsikbal, our grandfathers chose very carefully the words that they use. And sometimes they make complex understandings and analysis of the environment and the, and the life. And sometimes they have to rely on, on analogies and stories that might be translated as just myths, right? But by analyzing stories like the Yache, it's like we can understand that, um, that these stories are beyond just a, like a myth, like as, as proposed by some, some uh, by proposed by the Western society. So in this case, this rescue or rediscovery, the oral stories from our elders and grandfathers is part of the process of continuing this cyclical view of time because throughout this story, instead of thinking of the future as isolated from the past, we are connecting our past in front of us when we start thinking about these stories, when we start thinking about these, these, these um, knowledge from our grandparents. So to finalize, I would like to say that my project allows for the possibility to connect modern history with indigenous epistemology that has been developing. No. <laughs> oh, yeah. A century, my project allows for the possibility to connect the modern history with indigenous epistemology that has been developing since the beginning of the 20th century and recovered ancient ways of knowing. At the beginning of this presentation, I talk about the historical significance of the Yahche and how it is connected to the understanding of the past. At this moment, I'm working and comparing these oral stories with the work of the Guatemala novel laureate, Miguel Angel Asturias, and the understanding of history from the perspective of Mayan people. In Asturias' book, Hombres de Maíz, Men of uh, Maíz, uh, one of the main characters of the is the indigenous leader, Gaspar Ilom. In this story, Asturias narrates how Ilon was poisoned by the Ladinos or no indigenous people. When Ilon realized this, he went to the river to drink water. However, he finally, he, he finally decided to jump into the river where he died. While the Ladinos saw the death of Ilon as the end of the indigenous leader, Asturias provides another interpretation which has connection with the journey of the twin gods Hunapuk and Ishbalanke from the Popol Vuh. In these narratives, the twin brothers went to the underground world where they encountered the gods of the Shibalba or death. When the first generation of the twin brothers died in the Shibalba, future generations continued playing with the Mayan gods of the dead, of the underground to eventually win. The death of Gaspar Ilom can be interpreted as a journey similar to that of the twin gods that went underground to the land of the dead before returning to the future. The history of the Yahche shared among modern Yucatec Mayans and the representation of the Burn tree as illustrated by the cook recur similar messages. Or communities may appear dead or uh, uh, silenced, but it is a matter of time before the Mayan appear again. The Maya people, the Maya view of history is cyclical in the sense that the continuities and leaders pass time in the underworld before coming again to the surface. The cyclical process also underlies how the tribes, challenges, and victories of indigenous communities are not part of a linear path of progress, but rather a continual cycle. Thank you so much. Dios Botic, gracias. Thank you so much, Hader, for this really wonderful presentation. And I, I think I speak on behalf of all of us when we extend our sympathies to you and your family at this time of grief and loss. Uh, we have time now for questions and discussion, um, and I'd like to ask everyone in the audience uh, if you would like to ask a question, if you could please either uh, raise your hand with the raise hand feature, or um, you can write in the chat that you'd like uh, me to um, um, ask you to speak, or you can just post your question in the chat if that's more convenient. 
Yes, we have a question from Josephine. Hi, hi, hi there. Thank you very much for your presentation and thanks to the University of Minnesota as well for organizing. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Notre Dame in political science and I'm working on the on war legacies and I'm, I'm looking at the case of Guatemala. Oh. And so I wanted to ask you to what extent you think that this uh, pan Maya movement was a grassroots movement. So to what extent did it actually mobilize ordinary people and how the trickling down of this movement or, or the, the grassroots component of this movement was influenced by different patterns of violence in different mm -hmm. areas. Mm -hmm. um, and I, what I mean by this is that in some areas we see the total displacement of communities and their replacement by people more favorable to the regime. And so do we see still this, this mobilization in those communities or do we, uh, do we not see it? Do we see something else? Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, so as a story, um, I have seen these uh, efforts from indigenous communities to kind of create one movement since the 1970s. And I've seen this as an intellectual movement. And, they, and one of the things that I work with uh, is like this a grassroots publication called Ishim. Ishim in Maya, not just in Maya Yucatan, but like in all of the Mayan languages, Ishim means corn which just by saying that we are talking about the shim, it's like we are talking by the common word or the, the common thing that we share as indigenous groups. So in this publication, something that uh, the authors that from the uh, started in 1976 to 1980 uh, is trying to create, to, to propose this idea of unity. But different from the Pan Maya movement, these authors talk about the indigenous race based on language. Based, based on language and dressing. So this idea of this unity among indigenous communities is an idea that opposes to the idea of like, we are indigenous, we are this race because we speak these languages. And then there is like these other groups that are the Latinos or non-indigenous groups. That was a huge problem for those communities to how to articulate, how to deal with these other groups that were neither powerful Latinos because they were poor Latinos as well. And also some indigenous elites that uh, also kind of were part of the elites of the governments in some, some, some places, right? So in that sense, this idea of the Panmaya movement that is featured at the end of the 1980s is slightly different from these discussion from uh, uh, local intellectuals in the 1980s. And again, I think this period between 1980 to 1985 is very significant because of the violence. I mean, we cannot just deny the violence that happened there, no? So the leaders of Ligo Roberto Minchu were not able to stay in the country. Many of these, I mean, you cannot say your name as indigenous scholar because the, the government could kill you. So the adoption of human rights for me is a tricky movement. And it's a tricky movement because it opens the possibility for these local organizations to extend the networks to the international level. But that implies that they have to adopt certain characteristics of the international human rights movement and international human rights discourse in which they have to negotiate about what things they will be highlighting into the movement. In that sense, the, 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 the Panmaya movement is shaped by these international networks, but is shaped by this international discuss, discussion in which there are things that are left behind. There are two things that I think are, 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 are examples of this the role of women on how they see women in, 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 in indigenous communities and also the, the environment, no? How to connect human rights as, as part of the, of the, of the of, uh, I mean, how to connect environment as a human rights issue. Now we are seeing that this is something that is trending, but this is something that indigenous communities and indigenous intellectuals were discussing in the 1970s and the 80s because they were part of that. But the way in which they explain that is like, we believe that, for instance, as the, the mountain is our mother. Therefore, you can exploit your mother. So there is like another epistemology that is based in the story that tells you how to represent that. But by translating this activism to human rights, you have to negotiate these epistemologies into this translation. And I think that is what happened in the Panaya movement as well. And that is why it has a lot of criticism, particularly in the, in the 1990s. But again, I think the, this idea of unifying these groups is, was a huge intellectual effort. I mean, 
today is, I mean, I identify myself as a Maya. I mean, okay, yeah, we have a sense. Back in the day, no. I mean, there were other words that were used, like the Indio, like the, I mean, there are other words that are very discriminatory, but this idea of the Maya such did not exist. Now we have a question from Barb. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Hader. Uh, really interesting presentation. And again, condolences on your grandfather. Um, your, your last um, discussion about human rights and the adoption of, of human rights by the Maya, that, that was the question that was really interesting me uh, through your presentation because you, you talk about how the, these organizations embraced human rights, but um, talk, could you elaborate a little bit more on sort of what the, was it a, a conscious sense of uh, that, that this was, as you suggested, a path to transnational activism to, you know, to what extent is there really overlap with the, um, with the principles that inform the indigenous uh, movement with the human rights movement and, and, and how do you see that changing you know, over the course of time that you studied since the 1980s? Is there, um, you know, and what, and what do you see as the conflicts? I just really love it if you would elaborate a little bit on this relationship with, uh, with an ideology that is kind of it would, it would appear to be imposed from the outside. Yeah. Thank you. So I, I think I think I, I just want to mention briefly the work of Samuel Moyne and, and like how he kind of discusses like these, the roots of human rights like into this Western society and also how human rights, for instance, has these connections with the ideas of the Catholic Church that both of them have these ideas based on the alignment of the existence of this universal law, of this creation of the, of the, uh, uh, Basically, I mean, the government, right? So I think the, the, the idea of the representation of one entity that represents everyone to this idea of the nation state is, uh, with, is, is very influential in Guatemala and any human rights movement because the Truth Commission is this attempt to unify this society into this. We can see this uh, activism of indigenous community when the Truth Commission in Guatemala say that we recognize that there are Mayas. And then maybe two or three paragraphs later, they say, we define Mayas as, and they, they define the 23 groups that represent the Maya. So the recognition of this unity with the diversity is like this entanglement between these local efforts to be recognized as indigenous groups, but different. So this idea between unity and diversity is like this kind of, balances that the Truth Commission in Guatemala had to deal with in connection with the nation state, because by the, by the end of the day, my reading of the Truth Commission is like this historical tale that wants to unify the country again after this process of, 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 of this. Over the years, I think uh, one of the discussions, not just in Central America, but also in, 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 not just in Guatemala, but in Central America, is about what has happened after this period of time, because the armed conflict were not just in Guatemala, but also in Salvador. I mean, there was like this so-called Central America revolutions. Activists, leaders, with, with today's kind of persecutions against indigenous leaders, with the corruption that exists, with the immigration, with the poverty, I mean, the list is endless. But people that participate in this movement and were activists in these movements, they were, they are discussing about what, 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 what what we were wrong, right? What we failed, how we fail in these issues, right? And my reading of that is like, it's not necessarily about failing or not failing, but it's about how we are understanding the role of these local communities over time. And that is why the cyclical view of time is very important. It's not just about always improving, going forward, like the, the nation state tries to establish, but also keep remembering, keep remembering that these issues are in a continuum in this cyclical uh, view of time. Um, and again, I think in that case, it's like it opens the opportunity for indigenous human rights, right? I mean, we have been talking about 
human rights within the perspective, I mean, we can articulate human rights within the perspective of the Catholic Church, this idea of universal human rights, human rights within the nation state. But what about if we start thinking about indigenous human rights that overlap in many ways? But I believe that they are different. And I think one of the characteristics is this historical perspective that they propose as one of the methods in which they uh, try to describe current situation, right? So in that case, going back to the past is something that sounds simplistic, but this is, is in fact an example of how these epistemologies are, uh, are working today. Thank you. All right, Belkan. Thank you, Heide. <clears throat> Thank you, <clears throat> Heide, for this beautiful presentation. And my question will be in part related to, I think, Barbara's question. <clears throat> Over the last week, I was reading a book. You can be familiar with uh, anthropologist Diana Nelson, her first book on uh, Finger in the Wood. And it published in late 90s. And it's basically about like the uh, Maya activists effort to create like the revit revitalize the past and the civil war itself. And like, so as a book published in the late nineties, your presentation uh, changed my perspective a lot because in the book, the term genocide never used, mm -hmm. but instead the focus was on the uh, idea of the civil war and how specifically, especially like the indigenous communities are mm -hmm. included in a much different way. However, as I said, like this term wasn't available at the time to use or to describe the event. But simultaneously, author also discusses how indigenous groups approach state, not as a way of uh, maybe uh, eradicating what the state is, but instead as a resource to be transformed and how they uh, found, for instance, language re revitalization efforts through uh, culture of ministry. And I was wondering, like the specific engagement with the state in the indigenous activism, starting with this 80s and how it shifted like in the 80s, 90s, according to your uh, survey, like the analytical survey. Can you, can you repeat the last part? I think cut a little yeah, bit. I wonder how the, rather than being a monolithic, actor, like how the state itself changed in the perspectives of indigenous activism? Mm -hmm. um, the Guatemalan state. Yeah, so something that is, well, first of all, in terms of like the, 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 the Guatemalan state, something that I, I think is, is part of the context of, of this discussion is like, starting in 1954 to 1986, Guatemalan's presidents were part of the military. And there is a huge mess between like who wanted to get power or who, who was. And in 86, um, it was the first um, uh, civilian president that occupied the, 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 the president, the presidency. One of the, one of the critiques of this, uh, I mean, you might think that, oh, well, uh, so the, go the government and the, the, the state changed, right? I mean, yet we, don't have, we, do, we no longer have a, a military president. Well, one of the critiques is like he was, uh, the, this president was a puppet of the United States and the, the, the elites in, the, in, the, in Guatemala decided to, to shift this perspective of having militaries in the presidency because of the international pressure that received. And again, relying on the advantages of working with human rights, right? So in that case, this idea of the evolution of the nation state was something that was Kind of articulate. I mean, at least something changed, right? I mean, we can say that this president was a puppet. We can say that this president was chosen because of the leads of the Guatemalan government receiving the international pressure of the United States of the international media. But then I think it, it was this environment in which communities were thinking that, well, maybe we can start doing um, uh, this negotiation with the government. In addition to that, these, these networks that existed in the 1970s were networks that had different affiliations, right? So for instance, there's one way that people read the cook is like, well, they were part of the leadership were part uh, of, the, of the guerrilla groups. So for instance, is the uh, Ejército Guerrillero de los, uh, de los Pobres, EGP, EGP, um, had many connections with the cook. 
and the cook and the guerrillas were part of this peace accords negotiation. So there was these links between these organizations throughout the guerrilla movement and throughout like in this process of bringing peace, the, the, the peace accords, right? The peace accords were, uh, was a long process that is initiated in 1986. I mean, the Catholic church played an important role there. And people from these networks, particularly the cook leadership, were aware of this. So therefore, is when they start talking about maybe if we part now that we have participated into the table by our representatives from the cook or like the, the different uh, guerrilla groups, we can be part of this. And as a matter of fact, the guerrilla group URGN became a political party. No, so it's like this, this, this feeling. I would say. I mean, the way I read it, this feeling at the moment that that this uh, organization can participate as a part of the government. I think it's one of the negotiations. But it's not only in, in, in Guatemala, it also happened in El Salvador. In El Salvador, the, the guerrilla group, government, uh, group became a political party and then it failed, right? But it was this spirit, even among women's organizations that have been working in El Salvador, they felt with these negotiations that by having the representatives of the guerrilla movement there, they can participate or be working with the nation state to create this new nation, right? And we can see the influence on like some documents, but in terms of the policy and the lab, there was something different. So I think it's like the networks and the discussion and the alliances that exist versus the, the real matter that is law and policy. Okay, we have time for um, one last question and I see Josephine has her hand up again. So yes, Josephine. Uh, unless someone someone who had did not have a question um, okay well I, I also just I wanted to ask you a follow-up question on, on what you were talking about about the moment of the peace accords um, so there seems to also have been a big moment of concentration and discussion about the Mayan identity in the refugee camps in Mexico in Chiapas and in Yucatan mm -hmm. and so how would you conceptualize the role of uh, returnees from Mexico in this genesis of the this idea of the Mayan um, human rights and, and Mayan movement inspired uh, mm -hmm. by this experience? Well, it, it, there, there are two trends because um, on the one way, again, Quiche, El Quiche and Huehuetenango are next to Mexico City. So many of these refugees, they, 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 they cross the border but they were relatives because these boundaries, I mean, even the Guatemala government today has a lot of issues trying to figure out its border with Belize and, and Mexico. So in that sense, these people, many of these people were traveling to these communities to, to, to communities in Mexico that they share the same language. They, they share the same, same, some relatives, for instance, the, the compadrazgos that existed there. So there was like this trend of refugee. One of the things that is interesting and very sad about the, the refugees crisis that happened there is that some of these communities, or many of these communities that happened, that, that suffered this, uh, this issue, were communities that were created in the United States 60s when Spanish and American missionaries decided to colonize new lands in the Shkan jungle. So the Spanish missionaries and the American missionaries put together different groups from different indigenous groups to these new communities in order to give them land. So the identity of this, and even in the missionary uh, uh, reports, you can see how the name of these people changes from being Indios, just these ignorant people, to peasants. So that is a very small detail, but the identity for this, uh, for this communities for the missionary changes because they were from different groups, different communities, right? So you, within the Guatemala, you have immigration in this country in which they create this community, for instance, the Ishkan. When the bombing came, these people identify themselves as being part of the Ishkan. So they have to flee the country, they have to flee to other communities, they have to be refugees. So they, when they came back to, to, to these communities, they need to redefine their authority over the land because by the time when they left, the government put other people in these communities. So there was this struggle that existed there. 
So uh, this idea of the Maya community, that was something that was very strong in, in Guatemala City, was something that resonated in this rural community that say, well, we are Mayans and we, 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 we are part of, uh, of this. Because this idea of the Maya connect land with identity and, and, and language. I mean, and there is a huge uh, translation for that. But again, the Pan-Maya movement has many, many problems. And I think um, the work of David Stoll, for instance, is, which I don't necessarily agree with in everything, shows shows how like the, the this this idea that also the Maya and the mythification of the Maya also uh, is part of the intervention of Western scholarship, right? So I think um, I'm gonna leave it like that. Thank you. Okay. Um... Peter, thank you so much for, for this really enriching uh, presentation and, and, and discussion. And thanks to all of you who participated uh, and showed up today uh, to um, join us in this conversation. Um, we look forward to engaging with all of you in, in uh, following uh, events of the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies. Um, thank you so much, Hader, and everyone have a, have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.